What motivates people to commit horrific acts of political violence? Can psychology shed any light on how and why these groups dehumanise other groups? And can anything be done to choke off such processes? In the 1960s, a group of British scholars began an extraordinary project to investigate these disturbing questions. Now on Radio 4, drawing on the original tapes of the group's meetings, the historian, Professor Daniel Pick, explores this attempt to excavate the roots of extremism. Who is this? What can you tell from his voice? Is this man good or evil, sane or insane? This was Adolf Eichmann, one of the chief organisers of the Holocaust. His trial in Jerusalem in 1961 captivated the world. But what motivated him to do what he did? Many thought the senior Nazis' motives sprang from German peculiarities, sadism, or even frank madness. Yet the psychiatrists insisted Eichmann was sane. The political philosopher Hannah Arendt thought he'd revealed something we'd ignored about the Nazis. The social psychologist Professor Stephen Reicher. Arendt says, look, we were waiting. We were waiting to see this man who was the architect of the Holocaust. And we expected a monster. And what did we see? We saw this mild man, slightly hunched, fastidious, like a typical bureaucrat, who says what is truly terrifying was precisely that he seemed no different from us. She talks about the thought-defying notion of the banality of evil. Fathoming the enigma of that all-too-human thing, inhumanity, became a great quest of the post-war years. This is the story of an attempt to unearth the roots of extremism. It's a story that will take us from grand English hotels to medieval witch hunts, but it begins around the time of Eichmann's trial, with a meeting in central London. None of the Nazi leaders had a medical history approaching insanity. The German public who gave them support and power were not mad people, but ordinary folk. One man who was horrified by Eichmann's ordinariness was the wealthy and well-connected editor of The Observer, David Astor. In April 1962, Astor made a speech in St Pancras Town Hall. We have seen how sanely Eichmann behaved throughout his trial, and indeed throughout all his private and public life, except for this terrible work of officially approved human destruction. Many studies had tried to identify types of people who had something called an authoritarian personality. But like Arendt, Astor shifted the focus. Perhaps what we have seen is an example, a supremely terrible example, of the pathological possibilities of the normal mind. But why would this urbane, busy and privileged man be so concerned about the pathological possibilities lurking in you and me? Looking back, it seems as though many of Astor's crucial experiences had culminated in this impassioned speech. In the 1930s, he'd come face to face with both Nazis and Stalinists. I was sent to Germany to learn the language a couple of years before Hitler came to power. And I saw the sort of preparations for them coming to power. And I got a, a, a sniff of what the Nazis were like. I think he always instinctively abominated what he saw then and there. At the same time, he was taken to Russia. I think those two trips, plus his instinctively sort of liberal, tolerant cast of mind, made him very suspicious of and gave him a great dislike of absolutist politics. Jeremy Lewis, who is completing a biography of Astor. Astor's opposition to the extremes was deeply influenced by two friends. One was Adam von Trott, a German aristocrat he'd met at Oxford, who was later executed for trying to overthrow Hitler. The other was George Orwell. Orwell insisted that authoritarianism could triumph again, and it was vital to understand its emotional appeal. But unlike Orwell, Astor placed great hope in a method which had brought him personal relief, psychoanalysis as his daughter Lucy explains. I think he was in pain and he was looking for help. He was analysed by Anna Freud and he felt it had saved his life. Astor's years on the couch led him to make a leap of faith. 
that psychoanalysis could unravel the mystery of collective violence. What should we do now? A centre of studies of what might be called political psychopathology should be founded. Really by chance, I happened to pick up a copy of Encounter, which had in it a lecture delivered by David Astor. When Astor's speech was published, a mildly spoken academic at Durham University, Norman Cohn, saw an opportunity. Like David Astor, he had first-hand experience of extremism. He had visited Germany in 1937, and his wife was Russian. Her mother had been shot on Stalin's orders. Not long before his death in 2007, I interviewed Norman Cohen as part of my academic research in a pub near his cottage. He told me about working as an army intelligence officer in occupied Austria, an experience that had inspired his hugely influential book, The Pursuit of the Millennium. This was a study of the medieval movements that hoped to redeem the world by killing all Jews or priests or property owners. This remarkable feat of research has had profound impact ever since, from philosophy to modern novels. And Cohn linked these medieval utopians to Nazism and Stalinism. One day, just after the war, Cohn overheard a captured SS officer talking to another about his pride in the final solution. I remember one SS colonel, he said, you know, we haven't really lost the war, we got rid of the Jews. Every time he tried to talk about it, he cried. Marina Voikanskaya was Norman Cohn's second wife. She got terribly emotional about it. I think, I don't quite know why. He was very concerned about the underdog. To Cohn, Astor's call for an investigation into how people could end up thinking and acting this way was a once-in-a-lifetime chance. By bringing together social, psychological and historical understanding, might the roots of extremism be unearthed? Norman Cohn wrote to David Astor in November 1962 and said, if this scheme, or even a major part of it, can be successfully carried through, it will be for me the fulfilment of a dream which has haunted practically all my adult life. To the world at large, it will offer a chance, however slight, to make all the horror and misery of this century yield at least some scrap of wisdom, some accession to our poor stock of sanity. Can you help yourselves to more coffee as you... And so, on a November weekend in 1962, Astor convened a meeting at his serene country home in Oxfordshire. For this programme, I've been given access to David Astor's privately held set of tape recordings of some of the Columbus meetings. As this never previously broadcast archive reveals, the Columbus team realised they had taken on an enormous subject. But where on earth should they begin? What case studies in cruelty and atrocity could really be compared? Well, I, I, well, I include Sharpville, a propensity of people to beat Negro uh, servants to the point when they die. I, I would have thought these were all examples of violent behaviour on an organised scale. That's uh, the sort of static prejudice of the un position of the untouchables in India. Cohn insisted that this was not just a scholarly exercise. It was meant to find practical ways to stop fanatical violence triumphing again. If we didn't believe that we could achieve something more than academic, a collection of, of information, academic interests, we wouldn't presume to be doing this. We wouldn't certainly wouldn't be trying to well, raise right. hundreds of thousands of pounds for it. And so this ambitious team set about its grim task under the name the Columbus Centre, a strange name whose origins no one seems able to remember. We decided that features in these movements, which might lend themselves to psychoanalytical study, were the personality of the leader, the ideology, treated as a collective fantasy. Bear in mind that we are concerned above all with unconscious motivations, unconscious sources of destructiveness. True to David Astor's grand style, working parties were held at the Waldorf Astoria Hotel. And there, in 1963, Cohn suggested they focus on examples where hatred came first where one group dehumanised and destroyed another, in the absence of any obvious conflict. Well, there was, was no particular reason, really, why uh, the six million Jews were killed by the Nazis. Uh, it certainly couldn't be accounted for in terms of, of economic conflict between Jews and Germans. It was done 
in the name, of course, of what was always invoked was the idea that there was a Jewish world conspiracy directed against the Germans and against the Aryan peoples and so on. That was a, uh, an idea which took quite a lot of working out. Uh, <laughs> no such conspiracy in fact existed. As Professor Frank Chalk of Concordia University in Montreal explains, Cohn set out to trace this most damaging of myths, the Jewish world conspiracy, and why it was so crucial to the Nazis' mission. Jews are seen as sucking the lifeblood out of the savings and investments of good, decent German and other citizens. And Norman saw that the dissemination of the core ideas of a universal Jewish conspiracy that dominated the world had played an incredible role in the run-up to the Holocaust. But why had this poisonous slander proved capable of galvanizing so many people into a murderous political movement? Cohn thought psychoanalysis provided an answer. The myth of the Jewish world conspiracy chimed with buried resentments, such as those against harsh authoritarian parents. There are, in fact, many people who never cease to be small children in their emotional lives. Such individuals need bad authority figures, scapegoats on whom they can blame all their misfortunes and whom they can hate and attack with a clear conscience. Cohen wasn't suggesting this applied to everyone but that, along with the paranoid psychopathological fanatics, toxic myths helped to generate enough passive support, or even just indifference, to make killing possible. Up to this point, Astor and Cohen's search for the roots of murderous ethnic hatred had been conducted in strikingly genteel surroundings. But now, one of the Columbus team, a leading psychiatrist called Dr Henry Dix, began a book that meant coming face to face with the individuals on whom genocides actually depend. The foreword to the book makes the point that there were many studies of Hitler and people at the top level of the Nazi uh, regime. The thing that was less well known was the people who killed with their own hands. Were they mad, were they bad, or were they very ordinary? As his son Adrian remembers, in 1967, Dix, then in his late 60s, set off for West Germany to meet former SS men and concentration camp guards in their prison cells. Dix listened closely and found the experience immensely uncomfortable. What he very much depended on was my mother being there to keep him company and keep his morale up. She found it very gruelling as well. The real horror of it is being confronted personally with people that did these indescribably awful things. and I, I hesitate to, to mention them on air, but it's well documented how cruel, fiendishly, deviously torturing these people were. One of the things that comes out of it is actually they didn't have to be. There was much that just came from them personally when the floodgates were released and they could let out all the hate in them to innocent and defenceless people. What do you think they made of him? One man brought in a stack of documents all designed to prove his innocence and the injustice of it all and the mask slipped and he quickly started ranting about an international conspiracy of Freemasons, international financiers, Jews. What stands out for you the most about that actual direct experience he had? Well, I think revulsion, perhaps to some extent surprise at the ordinariness of these people once the genie was kind of back in the bottle. In 1972, Dix delivered a book called Licensed Mass Murder. He acknowledged the crucial role of Germany's interwar woes, unemployment, inflation, the slump, in mobilising support for the extreme right. But he also homed in on festering grievances, on the impact of dead, damaged or highly authoritarian fathers, and the denigration of women by a hyper-macho culture. His focus was on, as Astor had it, the pathological possibilities of the normal mind. He refers to a kind of hidden area in all of us which would be very nasty if it were allowed to get out. So he's saying that everybody probably has potentially murderous instincts. But in a few people, they're not controllable. And in a culture that actually wants them to do everything that their worst fantasies impel them to do, the Nazis actually opened the gates to exactly this. So by this point, Dix and Cohen hoped that they had untangled several of the roots of extremism, 
there was a well of murderous hatred stored up in many ordinary people. There were pernicious myths that helped direct the hate at others and dehumanised them to the point where killing them seemed acceptable. But perhaps the crucial tool of extremism was the group. Belonging to a group like the SS, or even the German nation itself, could offer you free cover to deny all weakness and badness in yourself and project it all into other people. And the danger lies not just in the in-group's hatred of the out-group, but in the in-group's exalted view of itself. This became clearer when Cohen and his colleagues looked beyond the Jewish genocide to the fate of the gypsies. Their destruction was even more astonishing because they did absolutely no, they, they were insignificant and, and tiny minority of no influence or importance. But they were also tortured, castrated, um, uh, and sterilized, and killed, buried alive, and so on. Why? It turned out that two writers were already working on a book about the gypsies' sufferings under the Nazis in a bid to help the Romani people win some financial reparation. So Cohn brought them into the Columbus Centre. Here, too, the project was reaching beyond its genteel base. One of these activist writers was Grattan Puxon, whose life had followed a rather different path from Asta, Dix or Cohn. I'd left school when I was 16. I had trained as a journalist, but I then had to run away from Britain to escape military service. I was one of these people that felt that the state shouldn't have the right to put you in the army, and I'd gone off to Ireland. And that, of course, is where the whole gypsy and traveller life started for me. The first time I met up with Norman Cohen, I was summoned to go to his office in central London. As I remember, we sat back in easy chairs and had a pretty easy-going talk, and I felt very encouraged under his guidance, it was to be extended to more of an analysis of why it had happened. That took us then back into the Middle Ages and the questions of how these roots of, of prejudice had developed. Puxon uncovered another tangle of toxic myths. The gypsies had come to be seen as a dark, dirty, rootless people with supernatural powers who were partly to blame for the crucifixion, stole children and so on. Such pernicious beliefs had kept the gypsies as an outgroup for centuries. All these things led steadily and almost, you might say, irresistibly towards the genocide against the gypsy people in the Second World War. I think personally that the greatest accusation that the Nazis, that is the Nazi ideologists, had against the gypsy people is that they would taint the Aryan blood, that they were dark people, they didn't fit in, they weren't useful to the German militarised society and therefore should be killed. So the more exalted the Nazi vision of Germany, the more it demanded outgroups to destroy, even one so marginal as the gypsies. But the Columbus writers also ranged well beyond the Holocaust. The lawyer and anti-apartheid campaigner Albie Sachs had endured months in solitary confinement in South Africa. Sachs's experience showed how persecution can not only divide groups against each other, but also victims against themselves. I'd been extremely puzzled by why it was so difficult to be brave, why something inside of me had been longing to speak to my interrogators, to cooperate with them, to please them. Uh, who was this other me inside of me? And that led me to Freud. Sachs joined Cohen and the Columbus Centre at Sussex University to write a study of South Africa's legal system and its perversion of law in the service of violent racism. The Columbus Project searched for patterns across history. So next, Cohn delved back through the centuries to produce another pioneering study, Europe's Inner Demons. Norman connected the dots between some of the great mass persecutions in history. Frank Chalk. Ranging from the persecution of the Jews of Alexandria right up through the persecution of the Cathars, continuing on to the destruction of the Knights Templar, the great witch craze. And what connected all of these mass persecutions was a very clear set of allegations that all of these groups were guilty of engaging in incest, cannibalism, 
and entering into a pact with the devil. Norman understood then that there was something very deep in human psychology which made us vulnerable to these kinds of false allegations. These groups could only be dealt with through their total annihilation. I asked Cohn's widow, Marina Voikanskaya, about how Cohn saw all this. I think he thought the whole thing was connected. It was part of the same thing that we cleanse about. Then we come to really, really good life. The fantasy that you could purify things. That's right. That also involves mass murder. Yes. yes. And how did you feel as someone who'd fled the Soviet Union? How did you feel his work connected with your own experience of politics? It made enormous sense. But it's also, you know, from the age of five or six, I was daily called the dirty Jew. Every day, in the street, at school, everywhere, I was called the dirty Jew, and I didn't know who the Jews were. And Marina Voikanskaya's childhood bewilderment captures an insight her future husband was to draw from his investigations. He understood that it was the perpetrator's definition of the boundaries of the group that created the lethal killing field. It was not what sociologists and historians regarded as race, nationality, ethnicity, and religion, but rather how the perpetrators defined the group. By 1980, the Columbus Project came to a close. It had covered lots of ground, and it was not as male-dominated a project as it might now appear. As well as psychoanalysts Pearl King and Elizabeth Spilius, the sociologist Christina Lana had contributed a major study of Scottish witch hunts, and Ray Sherwood led months of fieldwork in a single ethnically mixed neighbourhood. But had it come up with an overarching insight and even some sort of cure? At Montreal's Concordia University, Frank Chalk has pioneered the academic study of genocide, with the help of many visits from Norman Cohn. He argues that Cohn's work on the role of groups has had real impact. The Yugoslav and the Rwanda tribunals have, in their jurisprudence, actually integrated into the opinions of the majority of judges some of the insights we developed with Norman's help, that it is the perpetrator who defines the boundaries of the group. So the Tutsi of Rwanda, who were the primary target of the 1994 genocide in Rwanda might not be, in scientific terms, a racial, ethnic, national, or religious group. But in the eyes of the perpetrator, they were a racial group, which was conspiring to oppress them. And the judges at the Rwanda tribunal said, that's what matters. However, at the heart of the project there was a tension between David Astor and Norman Cohn, centred on Astor's boundless enthusiasm for Freud and the unconscious. Yes, he thought that psychoanalysis would provide the answer. With planes flying above in the Hertfordshire sky, Cohn told me he felt in the end that Astor had placed too much hope in the capacity of the idea of psychopathology to explain fanaticism. He went so far as to describe Nazi Germany as a study in collective psychopathology, but that's absurd. Today's social psychologists, like Steve Reicher, seem inclined to agree. The Columbus Centre helped move us away from the idea that only certain people have an authoritarian personality. But that, Reicher says, was not the end of the journey. My sense from reading Astor and then subsequently reading Dix is that they go halfway. They don't get away from a pathologizing psychology. They just think that everybody's got it. We need to understand the ways in which certain conditions, and to me those are social conditions, create particular views of self and other, rather than believing that somehow there is a corner of the self which becomes dangerous. Reicher's unease with the idea of psychopathology points to the turn that has happened in the ongoing search for the roots of extremism in the years since the Columbus Centre wound up. John Horgan, Professor of Terrorism Studies at the University of Boston, who has spent years interviewing people who have committed appalling acts of political violence, says the focus has moved from internal factors to the power of situation. 
we've gone from thinking about traits, if you like, to instead focusing much more on the process and how that process both appeals to people, how it draws people in, and how it changes people as a result. In some ways, the current state of play in the era of 9-11 and resurgent far-right extremism is evident in differing attitudes to the figure we began with, Adolf Eichmann. For John Horgan, situation is key. Steve Reicher adds in the importance of ideology. What Arendt says of Eichmann has passed into common sense. It's used for everything, the banality of evil. But recent historiography, certainly of Eichmann, has begun to challenge that viewpoint. Okay. It says that, no, it's not true that Eichmann was this mild, fastidious individual. He sold that self-presentation to the mm. court in, who were going to paint him as a monster, so he, he pretended that he wasn't. In 1944, the Allies were clearly winning the war, and Himmler realised this. And he wanted to do a deal of military equipment for the lives of Jews, and Eichmann fought him. Eichmann so believed in what he was doing that he didn't just follow orders, he didn't go along with his superior, he fought his superior. So the notion that Eichmann was this individual who was simply following orders, uh, like a typical bureaucrat, is quite simply wrong. What the work of Cohen, Dix, Arendt, and everybody since then has, has really given me is a profound appreciation for the role of the situation. I remain continually struck by the power of Arendt's analysis into Eichmann, and, and and I read the book every few years. Eichmann, as much as people wanted him to be a monster, he was a monster by virtue of what he allowed to happen, but he was a low-level bureaucrat, a terribly unimaginative person who, in some sense, was trapped by the language he had bought into. And we see this time and time and time again in contemporary terrorism. We rush to talk about terrorist masterminds, but the reality is the vast majority of people who are drawn to this activity nowadays are similarly low level. And they try to excuse and justify some pretty tawdry activity with reference to grand ideas. And this is why I, I am continuously drawn to that early work on, on genocide studies. I think it has profound importance today, and it's a shame that we really don't draw on it even more. Cohen and his colleagues looked for the roots of extremism in the interaction of minds, groups and political ideas. And though we might do this differently today, I think this was an admirable endeavour. If nothing else, their anatomies of Europe's inner demons and programmes for licensed mass murder force us to pay attention to just how easily outgroups can be persecuted. They were right to regard this as an urgent matter not just a question of historical interest. And they suggest we have every reason to be alert to ideologies that make people feel mass murder is a necessary evil, or, most chillingly of all, the ultimate political virtue. No, no such body of people ever existed, um, and yet uh, tens, if not hundreds of thousands of, uh, of people were burnt because it was believed that that existed. The Roots of Extremism was presented by Daniel Pick and the readers were David Kahn and Michael Burtonshaw. The producer was Phil Tinline. And this programme is Radio 4's Documentary of the Week. For more details, just search online for Radio 4 Choice.